হ্যাঁ হচ্ছে লাইভ লাইভ বলছে আর রেকর্ড তো বলছে
we had to read those questions. Um, but uh, I think what I really noticed is uh, after she came back from Ayuta to uh, while doing the project, I think she, uh, before that, she was more casual with the whole endeavor. I mean, she was a good student all the time. I was looking up uh, letters that I have written after her DSC, where I said that. <laughs> 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 So it's, I mean, that was before she did any project with me or anything, any visitor. I, I said that she is very good at, uh, she, she could think of things by herself and she could uh, do uh, very intense calculations very well. Uh, she was not the topper of the time, but she was on the, on the top. <laughs> all, the toppers were, uh, all the toppers were girls whose names ended with Ta. <laughs> so, anyway, she was one of them. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, after that, she joined her PhD. So, she was the first data student who went uh, abroad for doing PhD after taking uh, the directly from the MSc uh, program and after doing the details uh, as to this paper. And uh, I think uh, what I uh, really like about whatever number they have done until now, starting from 2014 when I uh, when we first met, is that it's uh, I think our progress is reactionary for us as well because lots of students are going to do PhD at various places, good places, and we obviously we feel uh, some sort of satisfaction. Uh, seeing that they are going to be very good places for, first of all, they are choosing a science career, at least uh, they are choosing to do a PhD, and that they are going to be very good places for doing the PhD. So those are satisfactory to us. But then I sometimes think that, well, I mean, okay, what, what is happening? I mean, yes, they are going to do a PhD in some place, but what is the outcome I mean, in terms of science, in terms of real contribution to uh, society, etc. In the academy, what is what is it that that happening? So what I find in Namrata is that she grew enormously, enormously. I mean, she was a very, I mean, as I said, she was brilliant, but she was not very good. <laughs> and then she uh, started MSc and became more senior. But then after she went to do the PhD and came back after one year, already in that one year I saw that she has grew uh, uh, to be more enormously more mature. So that is the actually because now I can say they okay. It's not that they are going someplace good to do their PhD, but they are going in our mercy. So that means it's going in the positive direction. So I think that's the uh, main uh, thing that I learned from Namrata. <laughs> that we are, what we are doing here is, uh, is in the healthy positive direction. Positive now Namrata is also. Uh, sort of consulting, I am consulting in Namuda for some projects, etc. So uh, now Namuda has already started to give back to the students, and I hope that kind of giving back will continue. Wonderful. Sure. I think that we need more funny introduction, but I think it's a little bit funny because that's the professors become when they age. <laughs> but I don't think yeah, that just that's to add uh, to what she said uh, and that Namuda has done this. Exceptionally well, and uh, uh, in fact, in Ayuta, who she was uh, working on the English Tripathi, he was telling to his graduate students, so, uh, I think after Narada uh, competed her LLC, that, oh, you know, my students said, for oh, many words, they don't understand. Then I said, how was Narada? Oh, he was already immensely mature. He, mature. He was already <laughs> mature in the LLC. And one thing I have to say, that of Namrata, how many postdoc offers you got, Namrata? I think three I think, prize fellowships. Or... Yeah, I think I got four until the end, and then I got four, like, which is like not prize. Okay, okay. So, so you can imagine the kind of work she did for her PhD, which ended up with seven, eight postdoc offers, and several of them are prize fellowships. So, we are very, 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 very proud of Dr. Namrata Dar. 
because she was a past graduate student who, uh, from our MSc program, directly went to such a prestigious uh, PhD program and did exceptionally well at the science. Without more determination <laughs> and not to offend that, sir, Dr. Namrata Rai will be directed this by Lord's star formation, suppression, and feedback in the thermal galaxy. This is not working. Um, but that's fine. Uh, but that's fine. Um, it's fine. I think we have. Uh, oh, you have to talk. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, both RC Sir and introductions. RC Sir and SC Ma'am. So, I'm really, really um, excited to be here. It, it it just it it feels different when I come back here as a speaker rather than you know sitting with you guys there. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm very excited to talk to you all about the work that I have done over, over the last five five and a half years during my PhD. So uh, so my talk is is I have tried to make my talk very non technical so that it's it's accessible so you guys can understand but if at any position you cannot understand anything or if there is something that's unclear please feel free to stop me and interrupt me uh, and i can explain so yeah <clears throat> so i will talk about the work uh, that uh, i have done so it's broadly about how galaxies stop forming stars towards the end of their lifetime and what's the role of the central supermassive black hole in that and in that context i will introduce this rather new but very exciting population of galaxies that were discovered that we call red geysers. And I'll show you why those are interesting and how they relate to this star formation and uh, feedback picture. Um, okay, but of course I will have to start by showing you this picture of uh, this wonderful, most powerful space telescope ever launched in, uh, ever launched in space. So uh, you all know about James Webb Space Telescope, I'm sure, uh, short is JWST. So JWST looks at the universe at infrared wavelength. And as I said, I'm, I'm so uh, amazed by what JWST can do and what JWST will do in the next few years. I'm just, I couldn't resist myself showing, showing this as a first slide. Uh, so this is the first, this is one of the first uh, few images that Webb took. And this is, uh, this was, the first image that uh, went publicly uh, available on July 12th. So here, this is a patch of the sky uh, around this massive galaxy cluster, which is called SMAX something something. Uh, can we move this somewhere? Uh, it's fine. Um, so this is called SMAX 0728. So this is a massive galaxy cluster that acts as a gravitational lens, but let's not go into that. But my point of showing you this slide is that this was one of the first images that Webb took, but it's already the deepest and the sharpest image that exists in the infrared wavelength right now. So this is the deepest view of the infrared sky that we have at the moment. And of course, you can see that uh, there are hundreds of galaxies. Each of these point blobs here, except this, this, this star, these are stars. But all these blobs here, these are galaxies. So there are hundreds of galaxies in this patch of sky, and there are many different shapes, size, and morphology of these galaxies. For example, uh, for example, there are spiral galaxies like this one. There are elliptical galaxies like that one, and there are also everything in between, like anything that you want to imagine a galaxy will look like, they will be there. So if we want to take a closer look at each of these galaxies, we of course have to look at nearby galaxies so we can kind of zoom in. So this is a picture of a nearby spiral galaxy taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see the incredible amount of detail uh, in this picture. So you can see the prominent dust planes along this uh, spiral arms. And you can see this, this bright blobs here, which are actually clusters of young stars which are forming out of this gas and dust. And so this is a spiral galaxy. So spiral galaxies in general, they are very young and forming stars actively. So that's why you see this kind of young stars, otherwise you would not see them. And th these galaxies in general have a blue color. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you have, you are uh, familiar with the concept of color. I'm sure Arsisar has taught you that, but uh, the way you can think about it is that 
since these are young stars, so massive young stars, they tend to radiate more in the blue wavelength. So that's why the entire galaxy has this blue color. Now, on the other hand, there is another uh, type of galaxy, which are elliptical galaxies, which look mostly spheroidal in shape. So these are not disc shaped that, uh, that, like the spiral galaxies, mostly el ellipsoidal. And these are old and evolved system, unlike the spiral galaxy. So I said spiral galaxies are young. So these are generally old, and these generally have very little star formation. So here, you don't see what happened. Okay. So, so these have little star formation, so they don't have that much, those young star clusters that I showed in the spiral galaxy picture. These are mostly old stars. And that's why since they lack young bright blue stars, these galaxies appear red in color. So that, that's why these are also called, they are sometimes called red and dead. So that's the term that we generally use. Now, at this point, you are thinking, well, why are you talking about star formation so much? The reason I'm talking about it is because a galaxy is uh, dominantly, uh, they are characterized by how much stars it's forming at this moment. So star formation rate is really important to define a galaxy. So then what determines how much star formation will happen? That is determined by the amount of gas and dust which is present in a galaxy. So if you remember the spiral galaxy picture, I showed you those spiral arms which have all those dust lanes, right? So dust generally traces cold gas and cold gas acts as a fuel for forming stars. So if you have lots of cold gas lying around, what, that, what will happen is that those gas, will, they will come together under self-gravity and they will collapse and at, at a certain point, they will trigger nuclear fusion and they will form stars. So if you have a lot of cold gas, you will form a lot of stars. And that's what happens in spiral galaxies, because as I said, they have lots of gas and dust. So, uh, so there is no complication there. But in elliptical galaxies, however, uh, I said that they have very little star formation, right? And just from this correlation, there's lots of gas means lots of dust. Uh, means lots of stars, you can say that, well, okay, so ellipticals do not have lots of star formation. So it should be the case that there is no gas. That's why there is no star formation, right? So that's the simplest picture you can think of. But turns out that's not true. Uh, there have been actually many papers uh, back from the 90s, uh, which showed that there are actually lots of cold gas which have been detected in the elliptical galaxies. Maybe not as much as the spiral galaxies have, but still enough to trigger some star formation that you should see. But the problem is that we don't detect that level of star formation that we expect to see, right? So you see the problem here. So you have cold gas, which should form stars, right? But they are not forming stars for some reason, because we are not detecting that level of star formation that we expect. So, Something is preventing the gas from forming stars, right? So that's our, uh, now that's our problem. So in order to explain that, the, the galaxy formation theorists or modelers, they have come up with many, many different scenarios. I'm of course not going to go through that, but I will talk about the, the most popular theory. So one of the theories is that a lot of energy somehow is being dumped to this cold gas reservoir. So if you dump energy to cold gas, what will happen is you either heat up the gas. So if you make the, if you, if you have a reservoir of cold gas and you give some energy, it can be any type of energy, you would either heat up the gas so the cold gas becomes hot gas and that will no longer form stars. So hot gas will not form stars or it can actually just blow up the gas away. So it can act as a, like a bubble. Or, or, or as a bomb, so it will just blow up the gas. So any of these uh, scenarios can happen if you somehow can dump energy to the cold gas. So, so what will provide this energy? So again, there are many different theories, but one of the most popular theory is that is a feedback from active galactic nuclei. So, uh, Connection, HDMI. 
Nak buat ni. Ya, it's kind of. जैगा <laughs> 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 कनेक्टेड है मैं चले ग ओके सो सो एज आई से सो वी इफ वी कुड सम हाउ डम एनर्जी टू द कोल्ड गैस वी वुड बी एबल टू स्टॉप forming stars by either heating the gas or just blowing it away uh so one of the mechanisms that can kind of supply this energy is uh, active galactic nuclei so what is an active galactic nuclei um so we know that uh, every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center and that is actively accreting mass from the surrounding and sometimes what they can do is they can uh, turn active and they can drive energy and radiation Uh, away from from the center, away to the surroundings, and then they can become visible over a large part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, that's that's what's a, an active galactic nuclei or AGN. Uh, but the main uh, the main thing here is that these AGNs or these black holes, they have a lot of energy in them. So it's of the order of ten to the sixty one, but it can be more or less depending on the accretion efficiency. uh and all this energy it it uh, it actually works out great because this energy is actually more than enough than what you need here to hit the gas that i was talking about in the beginning so what you need can be offset it more than like 100 or 1000 times by the energy that they have so even if like 0.1% of that energy can be coupled there you would be good so you don't need a lot of efficiency in that in that uh, model so how will you actually go about uh, doing this feedback what's the mechanism so around uh, 2006 2007 uh, this uh, new type of a new model for feedback was proposed it's called the radio or the jet mode agn feedback and the purpose was the same you just hit the gas so that's the your main purpose and how exactly that happened so in that model they implemented this sort of feedback in old massive galaxies so galaxies which are already kind of they have evolved uh, they have some cold gas lying around maybe not as much as spirals as i said before but some floating around and that gas will try to radiatively cool down very rapidly whenever you have some heated object it tries to cool down by radiatively giving away the uh, the heat right same happens with gas so if you have some gas at certain temperature it will try to radiatively radiate away the heat go down to colder temperature so that gas will try to do that and then some of that gas can make can make its way into the central black hole and then the black hole will accrete inefficiently and they will turn on this radio jets that i am showing here by this red and these jets ultimately will deposit the energy that you need to the cold gas 
So that's the mechanism that was proposed. And that actually worked beautifully in the models because that improved the consistency with observations uh, that worked out energetically, that worked out by numbers. It, it was great. And this model was actually motivated by real observations that we see in galaxy clusters. I'm sure SDMAM has shown you this picture many times. So this is a very classic picture of radio mode AGN feedback that was seen in a galaxy cluster. So uh, if you note the spatial scale, so this is 200 kiloparsecs. So this is almost like a megaparsec, which is really huge. Uh, so this is so this is a cluster, as I said. So here the the blue color indicates the hot, really hot gas temperature of millions of kelvins, uh, which is detected in X-ray. So this was I think this was taken by Chandra, and then the red color uh, indicates the synchrotron emission that is detected in radio. And then the central luminous blob that you are seeing has indicates there is a central AGN. And this AGN is driving these large scale radio jets. And if you, if you look uh, closely, you can see that these jets are actually creating these cavities in the hot gas, right? So that means the jet is interacting with their ambient medium and they are creating. Oh, yeah, go ahead. okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it's working. Yeah. So here, so this energy is actually preventing this hot gas from cooling down further and forming stars. So that's the point of any kind of feedback. But as I said, this is uh, this was seen in a galaxy cluster, and uh, so my question is. Can the same phenomena work at a much smaller scale of individual galaxy, which is like tens of kiloparsecs? So this was like 800 kiloparsecs or so. So we want this to work. We want to see if this works in like tens of kiloparsecs, right? So unfortunately, we don't yet have a straightforward uh, direct evidence of feedback in typical galaxies. Uh, uh, we, still, we still think that, that when we, we have an old evolved galaxy, they might have some cold gas flying around, lying around, but the reason this gas do not form a lot of stars and they remain dead is because something like this is happening in, in between. So there is some feedback that is happening, maybe not in this, this gigantic scale, maybe in a much smaller scale within a few kiloparsec rather than 200 kiloparsec that I was showing. And you can just see that if this is, this is much smaller scale, this is much fainter signal. So this would be really hard to detect. So the AGN associated would also be probably low luminosity. So these are faint signatures that we are talking about that we are trying to detect. <clears throat> so if we ask the question, is radio mode feedback responsible for keeping galaxies dead for a long time? The answer is we don't know yet. We have to find observational signatures in typical galaxies and actually know whether these actually holds true for in a galaxy scale as well. Sorry, can you share the screen? I think it's... Oh, oh, I think it got disconnected. Um, yes, I can share this. No, I think the internet got disconnected at some point. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now the question is, how do we go about detecting this sort of feedback, right? So for that, I have drawn the schematic where I have drawn some, some low luminosity AGN with some smaller scale jet. So remember, this, is, this would not be those large scale signatures that we saw in a cluster, it would be smaller scale. So these are embedded in the host galaxy, which is, which is the gray region. And in order to study feedback, you have to study both the black hole and the host galaxy because you would have jets interacting with the gas 
you would have gas kind of interacting with the black hole. So there would be a lot of correlation that is coevolution that is happening. Should I go on? Um, <clears throat> okay, so what are the, some of the observational tracers that we actually need to study this? Uh, so in order to detect and study the central AGN, you would need radio because these would be mostly radio AGNs emitting the synchrotron emission. You would also need some optical uh, optical observations to study the jets. You would obviously need uh, radio observations, but then you also have the gas, the gas, the multiphase gas in the host galaxy. And as I said, you need to study both the AGN and the gas together in order to know what is happening. How is this feedback happening? And in this multiphase gas, you have different temperature gas, you have different gas with different density, and you also need different observational tracers to study each of them. So for example, you have the warm ionized medium at a temperature of 10,000 10, Kelvin, so 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Uh, and these are generally traced by optical emission lines, like H alpha, O3, O2, the, the normal uh, emission lines that you hear about. There is cool neutral medium, which is at a slightly lower temperature, and you need absorption lines for that. You have cold molecular gas, which is at a further colder temperature and so on and so forth. You might also have those high hot X-ray gas that I was showing you. So what is the main point of this slide? So the main point of this slide is that in order to study this black hole and the whole galaxy together, you need to have a multi-wavelength observation. So you need to have radio, you need to have optical, uh, radio, infrared, and sometimes even X-rays if you have really hot gas uh, and which is generally seen in elliptical galaxies. So you need multi-wavelength observations and you need spatially resolved observation so that you can see or you can uh, analyze what is happening at different spatial locations in the same galaxy. So that would be ideal. So no, why yeah. What if there is no radio emission in the AGN? It's just an AGN that is dumping in. Yeah, so it could happen. Uh, the the so there is a long literature associated with that. So the jet mode or the maintenance mode that we talk about, these are generally associated with a radio jet. So they say that when you are when you have a hot accretion disk or accretion disk which is not that you know when it's not accreting a lot, uh, it's not it will not show this kind of blazer or a quasar like uh, outburst. You'd have very little trickling of gas, and then there would be something that will come out, and they will like borderline, they will be able to heat the gas. And it's generally thought that it's the radio jet that is doing that. And there have been like, you know, uh, like some radio literature, radio literature that people have looked at and they have calculated the energy and they said, okay, yeah, so the energy works out. So this might be the radio agents. But it's, I think it's kind of like historic. So in the model, they implement a jet. It could be visible in optical, but you generally don't see any optical jet in a, old galaxy. So I guess that's the uh, main uh, thing. I actually take plenty of money. Is it cool? Hey, I'm on my way. You can't get a video. I said, I'm not going to get a type fight for the other. Okay. Oh, I was answering your question. So, uh, yeah, it's generally like uh, historical, um, but yeah, you don't see a lot. of optical jet in an old galaxy, and that has you know, a large Eddington ratio, large accreting chain. So they have Eddington ratio of like 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. <clears throat> okay, so what's the, uh, so just kind of taking a step back, what is our goal? Our goal is to find this kind of jet mode or radio mode AGN feedback in old evolved galaxies. And uh, we need radio, but also spatially resolved optical infrared uh, for this. 
Okay, so that brings me to the survey that I have used a lot in my PhD. So it's called the Manga survey. So Manga is a part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4, uh, and it's an IFU survey. So IFU means integral field unit spectroscopy. So what that gives you is that it gives you spatially resolved information for each galaxy. And Manga has observed more than 10,000 galaxies in the local uh, universe. So that gives you a, 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 a really huge number of spectra to work with. And uh, that's what I actually used. Uh, Manga's wavelength range is also covering the whole of optical and a little bit of infrared. So it works out great for us. We wanted spatially resolved spectra in optical infrared, and that's what Manga is giving us. Just to kind of quickly illustrate the power of Manga. So you have an uh, old elliptical galaxy as observed by a normal SDSS image. You put your manga fibers on top, and then if you go and observe this galaxy, you now you get a spectra from each of the different locations, right? And just by looking at this galaxy, it's a random galaxy that I chose, you can just see that the spectra is changing a lot, right, at different locations. And let's say you are uh, interested in anything, let's say something like uh, the ionized gas, then you would look at uh, H alpha, as I said, H alpha O3, uh, normal uh, optical emission lines. And then uh, whatever property you're interested in, let's say you're interested in the velocity or the flux or the intensity or whatever, you can, you can measure that for all the different locations from these different spectra, and then you get a map. So instead of getting one value, you get a spatial resolved map uh, across the whole face of the galaxy. So, and as you can imagine, manga led to the discovery of many different things. And these red geysers that I'm going to talk about is actually one of them. So we have an ordinary elliptical galaxy again. Uh, there is nothing special going on in this galaxy. If you just look at it, the look at the image, uh, this is a completely red and dead galaxy. So there is very little star formation. Um, so these are moderate mass. So 10 to the 10.7, which is roughly what you expect from elliptical galaxies to be. And if you look at the integrated spectrum, which is not a few integrated, so just one spectra from the whole galaxy, you would see a spectra like this. So this is a typical elliptical galaxy spectra. The spectra is dominated by this kind of flake, which is, which is characteristic of old stars. You we don't have a lot of emission lines, which is again characteristic of old stellar populations. So again, this is everything what you expect to be in an elliptical galaxy. But then the authors of this paper, the Chang et al., they looked at the manga data of this galaxy, and this is what they saw. So here I'm showing again a map a spatially resolved map of uh, warm ionized gas as traced by H alpha emission line. And uh, the quantity which is plotted here is in angstrom, so it's, it's a bit weird. It's, it's actually equivalent width, but it's very equivalent to flux. So it's flux divided out by the stellar contribution, but you can think of it as a flux. And you see this kind of uh, bisymmetric structure extending from the center all the way up to the manga field of view. And it just by looking at it, it looks like as if material is being given out from the center. I, by material, I mean uh, warm ionized gas. So uh, this, the author of this paper, uh, Chang et al., they actually uh, measured the motion, the velocity and the kinematics of this gas. Uh, not going to the details, but they actually found that the, the material is actually consistent with, uh, with an outflowing wind scenario where gas is being driven out from the center in a bicone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, H alpha. So H alpha is at a temperature of 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So it's just H alpha emitting clouds. Gas, yeah. Yeah, it's a flux coming uh, just from the emission line. And from there, you calculate the velocity. Yeah, you can calculate the velocity from the emission lines by by uh, fitting, by different spectral fitting. Uh, yeah, so this galaxy was actually coined the name Red Geyser. Uh, red because it's completely red and dead. There is no star formation. And geyser because they kind of show this geyser or a fountain-like structure. So this name was actually given before I joined the project. But So uh, this is the kind of the first red geyser that was detected. It's called the poster child red geyser or the prototypical red geyser. This was the year when we started. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a year when uh, this paper actually came out. 
yeah, but I started working with Kevin the year after. So it was like a one year uh, gap. Um, but then I actually, uh, then the year after I joined this project and then I went back to the manga data and looked at the different galaxies, the elliptical galaxies. And I found that there are actually many, uh, many galaxies which look like red geysers. So I'm showing you some like nine galaxies here. And you can see this kind of bisymmetric structure in all of them, which is the characteristic uh, feature of this galaxy. And right now, I think uh, I have about like 160 galaxies uh, in my sample, but I have not finished looking at the whole manga sample. So there are many galaxies which I have not looked at. So since I have 150 targets right now, 150 red geysers, I can no longer talk about one galaxy as an outlier. I have to think of it as a population, right? So as a population of galaxies, where do they land? And since these galaxies show this kind of wind structures, this wind signatures, and they have little star formation, uh, we always ask this question whether red geysers show any evidence of AGN feedback. So this is kind of the big question that we have at the back of our mind when we were thinking about red geysers or when we were working on red geysers. But of course, this question is a, is a lot bigger than what we can address from just one thesis, like from my thesis. But that's the main question that we have uh, at the back of our hand. Like, do red geysers show direct evidence of AGN feedback? But let us kind of go, go to that question uh, step by step. So the first question that we ask is whether they have low luminosity AGNs capable of dri driving this kind of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious, how do you extract inside this map? <laughs> yeah. How, how small <coughs> So the spatial resolution is 2.5 arc second, but you have a pixel size of 0.5 arc second. So you can go, so you have each pixel measures 0.5 arc second on sky, but the FWHM is like three or four pixels. So it gives you 2.5 arc second resolution. So that's the smallest scale where you have information on. Uh, the how I get this so uh, so so first I have spectra from all these different spatial bins I extract the H alpha and then I fit it with different yeah and then I extract yeah 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 so these you cannot go down below two point five second for for each for some galaxy it actually the galaxies are smaller so you have a bigger IFU to work with, and then you can kind of modulate that to get a slightly bigger, but like that doesn't generally go uh, beyond like two arc second. I think 2.5 is the... Um... Some of these maps are now publicly Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, I think uh, there have been like a data product like release, uh, like a DRP release where they have, you can get all these maps now. Like if you don't want to do all this analysis, you can just get some ready-made maps that they have produced. But of course, it will miss out. When you say that you have 100 something of these. 150, uh, yeah. So how many did you look at? Out of how many? Yeah, so I looked at, so at that time, uh, so Manga has observed 10,010 galaxies. I looked at, I think, 2,000 something. Out of 2,000, you got 100 something that has red geyser like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these are all uh, nearby. So 0 0.03, 0 0.05. So definitely way less than 0.1. Yeah, so there are many selection criteria, as you can imagine. So first is that this is the kind of our uh, first defining property, so this feature. And then we look at how much star formation they have, whether they have dust lanes, whether they have like obscured star formation going on. So then we uh, look at the kinematics or the velocity, and then we see if these are like disks or if these are winds. So these are kind of the different uh, going kind of second step in the data. Oh, no, so the first step is mostly the emission line, the ionization. Oh, the 2000 galaxies were mostly red and red galaxies and then nothing else. <coughs> in the inner, in the yeah, yeah. Not, not no, no, no. So yeah, in from the entire SDS, like entire manga observed catalog, just 2000 galaxies, which are red and dead, elliptical looking. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I will not get through the whole talk, but it's fine. Um. So yeah, so how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay. So the first question that we asked is whether they have an AGN to begin with so that they can, if they can drive this sort of feedback. So since I've been talking about radio and RC said also as well, okay, radio. Uh, so this is the uh, survey that we looked at. So this is called the VLA first survey. And the reason we looked at it is because first covers the, the, the patch of the sky that SDSS looks. So they have a spatial overlap on sky. So all the objects that I have on my sample has a first data. Um, okay, so we already have the red geyser sample, right? So we have a sample of 150 galaxies. So our, what's our goal? Our goal is to see if the red geysers have more radio emission or less than a bunch of comparison or control sample, which is also old early type galaxies, but are not red geysers. So you generally construct, when you are doing this kind of science, you do is you kind you select another comparison sample to compare, compare your results with. So that's the control galaxies that we have. I'm not talking about the selection effects, uh, but you can ask me later. But uh, we have these control galaxies. And remind, let me remind you, these are all old galaxies as well. These are also elliptical galaxies, early type galaxies. But they are just not red geysers. Um, OK, so the first step was to check the radio emission. So the, the first straightforward thing to do is to just cross match with the first survey. So we did that. And we saw a three times higher detection rate in red geysers than control. So that is good. So that means the red geysers seem to have a higher radio detection or seem to have a higher radio emission than similar group of other early type galaxies. But that's not enough because uh, as I said, these are low luminosity signals. And I told you in the beginning in the introduction that you expect them to be faint signal. These are low luminosity AGMs. These are, are really hard to find. So, and the sensitivity of course is not great. It's like one millijansky. I cannot find. So this is the sensitivity. So one millijansky, which is, not that great. It's like really shallow. So yeah. No, so that this is individual detection at this point. So stack I will do in the next step. Uh, but yeah, so there might be when you are individually detecting, there might be few which are low luminosity and lie below your detection threshold. So for that, to so get around that, what you have to do is a stack as uh, SSR pointed out. So in the next step, what we did is we took all the uh, radio data, the radio cutouts around each of these red geysers, and we stacked them together and we measured the flux, the stack flux. And we did the same for control galaxies as well. And uh, in this plot, so the y-axis shows the radio flux, the stacked radio flux, and the x-axis doesn't mean anything, it's just all, means all the sample uh, is stacked. And here you can see that the red geyser show a higher uh, value. By the way, this is logarithmic. So this is like four to five times higher uh, than the control. But then uh, you can ask, well, okay, what if there are a few sources which are really radio bright in your red geyser source that will just drive your mean upward? So, you know, if you have 10 numbers and three of them are really high, your mean will be really high. So that would not be representative of the whole sample. So to get around that, what we did is in the next step, we removed all the individually radio detected sources. So, and then we again performed the stacking. So we removed everything that is radio bright. So then we performed the stacking. And again, we found a higher radio flux. And we actually continued this process for many different cuts. I'm not showing you all the, the results, uh, but in every way we stack, in every different control sample we selected, uh, we always got this enhanced radio flux from these red geysers. So that was the point of this paper. Uh, and, we, and we showed that this radio is coming from AGN. Uh, and then uh, we, the main takeaway point of this paper was that these red geysers, they seem to show this enhanced flux and this is coming from radio AGNs. So these should be having more radio AGNs than other early type elliptical galaxies, which are not red geysers. Okay. So the next question was, uh, we detected this radio, but this force have really low sensitivity. They don't have a lot of uh, sensitivity to faint structures. So in the next step, what we did is we looked at lower frequency radio data, which has much higher sensitivity to fainter signals so that you can capture all this detailed structures and morphology, which you cannot uh, detect with first survey. So we looked at low far data. 
And first of all, we actually detected many more red geysers in the low power survey because of their sensitivity limit. And the second is that we detected a range of morphology, starting from there is a compact in the first panel, there is a slightly extended that tells you that there is something there is just getting blended due to the resolution. Then there is this large scale lobed structures that you see in a typical like a radio galaxy. But all this, uh, all these sources have really low luminosity, by the way. So these are all 10 to the less than 10 to the 23. I think a few like goes above 10 to the 24 watts per hertz. But anyway, so we we see a lot of morphology, uh, a different variety of radio morphology in the structures, and these are really fun to look at on a each galaxy by galaxy basis and see. Oh, okay, we see a radio lobe here. Or, oh, okay, so we don't see a radio lobe here. So those, that was a fun time. Um, but in the next step, what we can do is once we have all these radio images, we can measure the end to end size of these radio sources, and we can also measure the flux by doing a pressure photometry. And we did that, and you can plot that in the radio luminosity versus size diagram. So here, the y-axis is radio luminosity coming from the sources, and then the x-axis is the radio size. It's not optical galaxy size, it's the radio size. So the morphology that you are seeing in the radio, that the end-to-end -end size of that. Okay, so the different, can you see the nice content? Okay, yeah. Uh, so the different colored contours that you are seeing, like these ones here, these are all existing uh, radio AGNs that already exist in the literature. So I just compiled it here. And the black stars here, these are the red geysers that I overplotted on top. And just to kind of guide your eye, so sources that light on the right-hand side of this diagram, those are extended sources. So those are the ones which have these large scale radio structures. The sources which lie on the left, these are the compact sources, which look kind of this blobby things there. And then the sources which lie on the bottom, these are low radio luminosity, and those on the top are high radio luminosity. So you can see that the red geysers, as I said, these are the black stars. So majority of the red geysers, they seem to be kind of populating this, this part of the diagram. So these are mostly borderline compact, and these are mostly low radio luminosity, as I said, that these are low radio luminosity sources. Um, so these are consistent with this RQQ, which is radio quiet quasars, and then liners and seaports. I'm not talking about them right now for the interest of time, but these galaxies have shown like uh, smaller scale AGN jets in their old papers, and they have followed up with higher resolution radio, and they have seen interesting features. But we don't have that kind of resolution with the low power images that I'm showing. Anyway, and then there is another uh, population of few red geysers, which kind of lie here. So these are kind of the more extended ones. So the ones which kind of trace the low luminosity tail of this FR1, FR2 population. And FR1, FR2 are those large scale radio galaxies that you generally see pictures of. So these are those ones, but kind of on the lower luminosity side. So I actually looked at the host galaxy of this population of red geysers and this population of red geysers, and I saw an interesting thing. I saw that the host galaxies of the compact radio source red geysers are actually younger, much younger than the ones which are extended. So these are more evolved sources and these are less evolved sources. So we think our hypothesis at this point is that maybe the red geysers kind of moves along this diagram in this direction. So maybe some of these compact sources can eventually evolve to those large scale ones that we saw. But of course, not all of them can be detected because this is this is really faint. This cannot this region of the diagram cannot be observationally detected because of certain brightness limits. So if some of them go like here, you would not be able to detect them. So there is a balance between detection, detection of low luminosity things, and the actual intrinsic brightness, right? So yeah, so that uh, was one of the results that we found. There are actually many other results in this paper, but I thought I would just go to the other, some of the other results. So now I will move on to the ionized property, the gas properties. And if I, uh, uh, and just to remind you, so now so the question is, do red geysers host this large scale winds that I was talking about? How do we know that? And just to kind of remind you why, sorry, go ahead. No. 
so just to kind of remind you why we are looking at that, the gas property, I told you that you have to study both the AGN and the host galaxy gas to know how they're interacting with each other. So we have already now seen a radio mode AGN presence, more presence of AGNs in these red geysers. But now we are moving on to this, studying this multi-phase gas. And the first thing that I will look at is this warm ionized medium at a temperature of 20 to 4 Kelvin uh, that ACMAM was talking about. And these are generally traced by optical emission lines like H alpha, O3, O2, et cetera. So I'll be mostly using H alpha just because these are more uh, seen more brightly in H alpha, but I could also use O3 if I wanted. Okay, so uh, how can I move this so you can see the. Okay, so this is a so this is another red geyser uh, with this their signature bisymmetric pattern in their ionized gas structure. And I have just pointed out in green so where you see those kind of structures. So if you now look at the velocity of this gas of this ionized gas, this is what they look like. Yeah, so this is what they look like. So this is the map of the velocity of those gas clouds that you are seeing here. So. So this, this shows redshift on one side, blue shift on the other, uh, with a velocity and amplitude going from plus minus 300 kilometer per second. So if you just looked at this map, if you show anyone this map, they could argue that, well, this galaxy could also be, rot could also be a rotating disk. Because if you have gas moving like this, if you project it along your line of sight, you have gas moving in one direction and gas moving in another direction, right? So it could be a rotating disk, or it could be an outflowing wind because gas is moving like that. And that also, if you are projecting it along the line of sight, you would have gas moving in towards you from one direction and then gas moving away. So it's really hard to know which one it is just by looking at this map. So I am not in the interest of time. Again, I'm not going to the details, but we have some initial uh, observations or initial evidence from manga observations that this outflowing wind is the case. But, uh, you know, whenever I used to give talks, uh, I used to get asked the same question that how do you know this is a wind? How do you know this is a wind? Uh, we had strong evidences from manga, but we need still needed some additional evidence that these are indeed winds and not disks because of this, confu this confusion that I told you, because this map looks like it could be a rotating disk as well. So how do we differentiate winds from disks? So we, so what I did is we, I constructed a toy model. So one is a wind model where you have a galaxy at the center and you have gas moving radially outward in a field bicone, uh, which is inclined at a certain angle to it. Uh, and then you also have a disk model where gas is moving in a disk, in a thin disk under the gravitational potential. So uh, I have two different models here. And what I want is that I need something, some observational parameter that will be different for this model and this model so that I can go and measure that property from the data and then compare and say, okay, this is the model that I want, or this is the best match model. So you need some sort of observational parameter so that it looks different in those two different models. And what is that parameter? That parameter is actually the the shape of the emission lines or the detailed velocity profiles. So remember, we are tracing our warm ionized gas by H alpha emission line. So I told you that we are using H alpha emission line. So if you look at the shape of the emission line, you can actually disentangle the different velocity of different gas clouds moving in in different direction. So in other words, in simpler terms, you just need the shape of this emission line because for wind models, you'd expect to see an asymmetric emission line. For disk models, you generally do not see this level of asymmetry. And that comes from simple geometry and symmetric arguments. And actually this shape has been used for like decades to study outflows and to study winds. So it's not something new that we invented, but it's the model that we actually constructed and we uh, predicted that this is something that we should see. So to differentiate between the two different models, we need emission line shape. And just to show you what these two different models predict. So this is, uh, this is a red visor and the contours, this black contours here 
So if we page also a biometric pattern, you can see this kind of biometric pattern here. So we put a rectangular box along this biometric pattern, and we calculated mock spectrum from that box from those wind and the bitmap. So you understand that, right? So please tell me if you don't understand anything. Uh, <coughs> so here, so this circles are basically meaning those spatial bins or those locations where I'm extracting the model. So you see, so you see different rows here, right? So the different rows basically means you are extracting those spectra from those different spatial bins, starting from the bottom most uh, panel. So the bottom spectrum is from this circular region. And as you go, as you march up this box, you go up the this panel. So that's just the correlation here. So this is mean model. This is this model. So the y-axis is plus, but it's an arbitrary unit. They're all normalized and everything. And the uh, x-axis, it's aligned, so it doesn't mean anything. So the color box basically tell you the velocity. So you can see that this blue shifted region has the same velocity here. If you read off from this, this should be the same velocity here. Anyway, so what you should take away from this point is that the wind model shows a lot of asymmetry, as I said. And this is actually, we got that from the model. We do not, we do not um, turn any knobs to create especially this kind of model. We actually simply just got that from the geometry. So the wind models produce a lot of asymmetry or wings. And not only that, the asymmetry actually switches from one side to the other. So you have so in the blue shifted part of the uh, galaxy, you see a wing on the red side or the positive side. And as you go to the red part of the uh, galaxy, you see a wing on the other side. And in the text model, you actually start to see there is also some asymmetry there. But it's in no way the same in magnitude as what you see. Huh? Which one? Huh? For? Yeah. So that's yeah. So that's because of the geometry. So if you, uh, okay, I can take a class on this. So uh, if you have uh, wind, right? So the gas, the gas is moving in a radially outward direction, right? So, so the so the wind is aligned at a certain angle with with you, right? So half of the galaxy, you have gas moving towards you. So that you will see as blue shift. And then other half, the gas is moving away from you. That side is red shift, right? So that's clear. Okay, so then the gas, we model the gas to be moving outward in the same velocity. So we don't change the velocity of our model. Every gas particle has the same radial velocity. So all of them have this something arc gap, right? And so, okay, and then if, so, if, you can see that this is a cone, right? So this is a field cone. So you have different gas particles moving in different, the same velocity along the radial direction, but since you are at an angle, you project them in your line of sight, so you get something cos theta. And that cos theta will change because of the, because of the, the cone has an opening angle. So, you know, particles moving here, it will have a greater cos theta. The particle moving here will have a less cos theta. And then what you do is integrate along the line of sight. So you're integrating every gas particle that is in, in your line of sight. So you will integrate different Gaussians with, with shifted velocities. So that's why you get these wings. Um, okay, so the predicted asymmetry is that you see a lot of asymmetry here. You don't see that in this model. And let me now show you what we actually got from data. For this uh, project, I did not use Manga data because Manga do not have that level of spectral resolution that you need to actually see those asymmetry. So we went to a bigger telescope. It's a Keck telescope that we have access to. Um, and uh, yeah, so we placed our slit on the same location that we actually extracted our model that is along this white feature. And we did the same thing. We extracted spectra along these different spatial locations along the slit. So, so we already have models for that. Just, just compare with our actual observations. So this is what we actually see. So here, this is the spectra coming from this location, and this is the spectra coming from that location. And you clearly see that there is the spectra is asymmetric, there are wings, and it actually switches from one side to the other. Um, so we got data for a few red geysers for different slit orientations, and we were convinced that these are wings. Okay, 
So I kind of the last question that I'm going to talk about is, uh, so I told you that there are multi-phase gas in these galaxies. So what about some of the other phases? Uh, so we already talked about warm ionized gas. So what about some of the other phases? So now I will talk about the cool neutral medium, which is at a slightly lower temperature, 100 Kelvin or so. And for this one, I will use absorption line, sodium D absorption line. Okay, so this is again showing four different red geyser examples. So the left plot shows the image taken from ACSS uh, GRI color, color images. The middle panel shows this warm ionized gas. And you can see this, this bisymmetric feature that I was talking about, this wind trapping those winds. And then the right panel, the green panels, show the sodium doublet absorption. So this is trapping the cool neutral gas that I am going to talk about next. And I'll give you a minute to just stare at the maps because they are good to look at. Um, but like, uh, so just by looking at it, you can see that the right, the green panels, they have a lot of cool neutral gas. So you can see that these are all these bright and regions. These are regions with higher sodium D, so higher cool gas. You can see all these like regions, mostly from one side, like having this kind of enhanced cool gas medium. And these are actually spatially offset from this like region. If you look carefully, they are not on the same locations, right? So the bulk is not snapped for the absorption. Yeah, so this is this is again equivalent with. So again, yeah, you measure the absorption depth, you calculate the area under the curve, and you divide out by the stars. But the, the main thing to look at is that they are not tracing the same location. So the ionized gas is tracing a different location than those cool neutral gas. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> yeah, for some cases they are. <laughs> yeah, in some cases they are, but in generally they are not. But uh, yeah, so that's not important. Um, so yeah, we do see a lot of cool neutral gas in these galaxies. And again, we have to ask the same question we asked in the radio. So do they have more neutral gas than some comparison sample or less? So that's what we keep doing, right? We compared it with some control galaxies, which are not red geysers. So again, we need control galaxies. So we bring back the red geyser galaxies and control galaxies that we had, but this time, we are actually splitting them up by radio detection. We already have those catalogs ready. We have already looked at their radio, right? From my previous project. So we now we look at radio detected red geysers, non-radio detected red geysers, radio detected control, and non-radio detected control. So we have four different samples now. So now I'll show you some maps. Uh, they are post-processed and their stellar components are removed and all that, but I'm not going to the details. Uh, but let me show you sample by sample. So this is again showing three galaxies which are radio detected. So these are non radio detected, but again, red geysers. And these are controlled. And just by looking at the maps, you can see that the first column, the radio detected column, has much more uh, sodium D, cool gas, than any of the other columns. The non radio detected ones also show some but not as much as these radio detected ones are. And by the way, these are just representative, these of the whole sample. So I have many galaxies, as you can imagine, these are just three examples that I'm showing. So in order to quantify that, what we did is we actually took uh, uh, average annular average, and then we created some probability distributions and uh, cumulative probability distributions of these different samples. I'm not showing that because that's a very complicated plot, but what you can just believe me here, if I say that we actually got the radio detected red geysers to have much more cool gas than any of the other sample. And you can just see that from these maps, right? So this was very interesting. Like why would the radio detection, which is something to do with the AGN in the center, have anything to do with the presence of gas in the galaxy? So this was very exciting. In the next step, what we did is again, we look at the velocity. What is the velocity of this cool gas? How are they moving around? So this is what we found. So you can see that majority of the factors, so these are spatial systems, so majority of the pixels seem to have a positive velocity or redshift. Uh, there are some blue shifts in the outskirts or sometimes in the middle, but majority of them are redshift. 
And we see that from integrated observations, we see that from stacked observations, we seem to see redshifted velocity for those, especially for the radio detected red geyser sources. And this was again, exciting. So, okay, so first of all, there is a lot more cool gas. And second, why is it redshifted? What does redshifted in absorption actually mean? So in order to understand what that actually means, you have to look at the schematic. So you have the galaxy at the background. So the galaxy has gas and stars, everything emitting. You are standing over here, you are the observer, and anything that is causing absorption lines should lie between the observer and the galaxy in the background, right? So those particles, the sodium D particles or atoms or whatever, they lie in between the observer and the galaxy in the background. And if those particles are moving into the galaxy, if they're inflowing, then you would see them away from you. So they would be redshifted. So redshift means inflow if you are looking down in absorption. So this is something called down the barrel measurement. And this has been used for many times uh, in absorption, when we're looking at absorption. You can only say that for absorption. For emission lines, it's very hard to say. So that means our, so our radio detected sources, they have more gas, and all those gas seem to be inflowing towards the galaxy. So our hypothesis at this point is that maybe they are playing a role in fueling the central AGNs because you need gas to fuel those central low luminosity AGN. Not a lot of gas, but still some gas so that you can, you can kind of trigger the AGN at a low level. And maybe some of these cool gases do that. Of course, we don't have that resolution to test that. 2.5 arc second resolution is not, is not enough to actually check that hypothesis. Uh, but this is our two go hypothesis. Right. Uh, size of what? Oh, 2.5 arc second is like is like one, not even one kiloparsec. It's like 1.5 to two kiloparsec for the redshift that we are looking at. Yeah. Okay. So kind of summarizing everything that I have said until now. So if you walk out of the room and there's someone asks you, what's a red geyser? So you should be able to say what is a red geyser. Um, so what is a red geyser? So these are generally old, massive elliptical galaxies. They have old stars, old and dying stars. So that's why they are like kind of dim and red. Uh, these galaxies have low luminosity AGNs uh, in the center. Some of them have those large scale jets. Some of them look pretty compact. And we think they, are, they might have some smaller scale jets if we could resolve them. And there have been examples that we have seen that similar studies have shown this kind of small kiloparsec scale radio jets. Um, but yeah, we don't have that ra uh, radio data yet. Hopefully with the new low far uh, 0.3 arc second one, we'll be able to do that. But anyway, we have radio AGNs and then we have uh, large scale, we see large scale uh, ionized gas outflows in the warm ionized medium that we trace by H alpha. A part of the gas is completely escaping the galaxy and we calculated that to be roughly like 20%. So not a lot, 20% of the gas is actually escaping the galaxy, but almost 80% of the gas is actually lying around. They are just, they are just there, they're floating around. So they might just come back after a certain point. And we do detect signatures of inflowing cool gas as well. They might originate from this recycled wind material that some of the winds going up, they might come back down after a certain time, or we might have gas accretion from outside like minor mergers or cosmological filament accretion or things like that. And the most interesting thing I, I think, and of course, yeah, I put the papers that kind of backs different parts of the story. Um, but I think the most important, the most interesting uh, piece of this puzzle is that these galaxies have very little star formation. And with all this gas lying around, you would expect to see a lot more stars. You would expect those gas to cool, cool down and start forming stars. So something must be preventing that gas to be really cold and start triggering star formation. So we think maybe this geyser wind that we are seeing is playing a role, or maybe the AGN jet is playing a role. Uh, but of course, we are not certain. As I said, it's not easy to say these galaxies have AGN feedback by just one thesis. You need many theses for that. Okay, so um, and I think the last kind of red geyser thing that I wanted to quickly say is that we also wanted to zoom in towards the center because that's where the AGN is. That's where all the activity is happening. We did that. Uh, we, we saw some interesting results. We see some misalignment between the large scale ionized gas and small scale observations. 
So we got some additional adaptive optics assisted phacocyrid time, which is really great. We zoom in even further in like 100 parsec or 50 parsec resolution, which would be great. Like we would be able to see gas very close to the central engine, not to the central engine, but very close to that. And I actually got some, I did some observing uh, sitting at home from Kolkata in the last few days. And um, yeah, we got some spectra. It looks very noisy, but it would look really good after we reduce it. And we'll be able to kind of construct this maps very, very soon. And we'll be able to see what we, uh, what we see. Okay, so I wanted to kind of uh, end by showing again, coming back to the slide, I have now renamed it to just wonderful space telescope. Uh, this is a pun that, <laughs> that has been going out now. Of course, uh, if we get something interesting from these AO observations in infrared, this was in near infrared. You can only do infrared, AO in infrared. We would probably be following up some of these red geysers with JWST. And as I said, James Webb uh, in, uh, looks at infrared wavelength. And often it's considered, it's, sometimes it's compared with Hubble. And I'm like, okay, how, James Webb is so much better than Hubble. Like it would be so, so much better than Hubble. So I have kind of put down some numbers here just to kind of tell you that James Webb has bigger mirror, better field of view, bigger spatial resolution, better wavelength coverage, better sensitivity, everything is better. So you would be able to see like fainter targets, bigger on sky area, distant objects because you are in infrared. So that's the important point actually, by the way. So if you have galaxies emitting at optical wavelength, and if they are at a much, much farther distance away from you, that optical light would get redshifted, right? So that optical light would get redshifted to the infrared. And you would miss that with Hubble, but you would be able to see that with James Webb. So that's why now showing you the same max field, but now it's a GIF of Hubble versus JWST. Of course, the brighter one is JWST. And you can see so many more blobs here. So, so many distant galaxies that you see you know, that you were missing with Hubble. And of course, another great, great capability of JWST is the spectroscopy capability. So it has I feel like Manga has, so it will give you spatial result information. It has multi-object spectra, it has prism, it has slit, it has slit left, it has every state of the art spectroscopy capability that you can think of. So we have already obtained spectra of redshift of eight galaxy. Like we couldn't have an image V equals to eight galaxy before. Now we are taking spectra. We are taking neon and hydrogen. Like I can't even, I, I stare at this spectra every day just to, you know, just to remind myself that this is such a wonderful time to be doing galaxy science. And I think also exoplanet science because I hear they're seeing really interesting things um, in exoplanet spectra. So just to kind of give you one snapshot uh, before my conclusion slide, so I, I am going to Johns Hopkins. So I will be working with some of the James Webb data and one of the programs. So there are, I think they are associated with three or four different programs, but one of the program is looking at radio galaxies at really high redshift. So we will be looking at the farthest known radio galaxy that's Z of four and Z of six. So really far. And we'll be using uh, near spec IFU. So we will place our IFU on top of this galaxy and we will get spatially resolved information on the host galaxy of those radio galaxies. And what we can do is we can do go and compare this with the radio galaxies at the nearby universe that we see and see whether this redshift difference is doing something, is, is giving us something different in terms of the physics, in terms of the host galaxy, in terms of the assembly history of the galaxies. So that's just one project. Unfortunately, I don't have anything else to show you, but uh, yeah, so just to kind of put up the conclusion. So I didn't put a, a busy conclusion slide. I just wanted to let you know that red geysers are interesting. Uh, so we have all these data sets. If you are interested, any of you are interested, uh, feel free to contact me to know more about these galaxies. If you're interested in a project, let RCC know, I guess. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and then JWST would give us really spectacular images in the near infrared uh, and mid infrared in the next few decades. So yeah, I think we are at a really exciting time and uh, yeah. I would take any questions. Okay, so it's Deepline. Uh, so I'm currently have questions in Deepline Priority. That's fun. And uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk uh, from Ramgrupa. I myself have, I think, 10 questions, but I'm going to first give, uh, give ask the uh, audience for questions. And we have Onuru, Tadlika, and Ozero. That's really interesting. Thank you. 
Yeah, so we didn't. So you are talking about which spectra? Let me just go back. Which one? Uh, this, this. Okay. So these are, so these maps are, uh, so these are derived from spectra, but these are actually images of where the gas would be. So let's say you have warm ionized gas clouds floating around in the sky, floating around in a galaxy. This map shows you where that galaxy, where that gas clouds would be in simpler words. These are derived from spectra, yes, but these are not spectra. This is an image of, you were just looking at the gas where the spatial location of the gas lies. No, you don't need to fix them. These are all observed. Here, with the data, we're looking at the HR spectra. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So these are all spectra from observed You can compare with FSPS. But uh, these are actually real data. So I have what I did. I took the spectra, I modeled the the lines, and then I extracted whatever I'm interested in, as I said, and then you get those maps. So these are all observed quantities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Control. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, so anything which is red geysers are in the red geyser sample. Anything which are not red geysers, but these are old early type elliptical galaxies, those are controlled. But yeah, so there are that's an interesting question because we actually matched the red geyser sample to like to produce this kind of control galaxies because you have to make sure that the the things that you're comparing is apples to apples. So we matched by you know color, stellar mass, redshift axis ratio, whether it was the morphology, things like that. So those are similar galaxies in a global sense, but those do not show the red geyser features in the-, in the They are also seen in Manga or you use that? These are all Manga, Manga. yeah. Control is also- Yeah, otherwise we won't have that same spatial scale maps. Yeah. So I actually have two questions. Uh -huh. The first is that when you're thinking the points of what is the creation criteria for Yeah, so yeah, so we selected by uh, comparing with uh, by matching with uh, some of the properties, like as I said, color, stellar mass, redshift, axis ratio, and we laid like a relaxation of like for axis ratio we had a relaxation of like one. For color we had a relaxation of like something plus minus like ten percent. For uh, redshift we had something plus minus point one. So very similar to what these red geysers are they will if you just take an sgss image of this control galaxies and if you take an image of red geysers you would not be able to differentiate them but if you then look at the manga data uh, you would look you would see this kind of ionized gas structure and these red geyser features in the red geyser sample but not in the control galaxies. okay so the second question you said that like the that's yeah, that's our hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. So, again, there are many hypotheses. So, first of all, when I say young, I mean younger. So, these are none of these are young. So, these are all very old and evolved systems. So, these are all above 10 to the 10.5 solar mass. So, these are not. Uh, 10 to the 3 solar mass. So these are none of these are actually young like spiral galaxies. So these are kind of younger and older within the elliptical galaxy range. Uh, but yeah, what drives that evolution? We actually don't know. There are many theories. For example, like uh, you may you might start up with like a small scale jet, and that jet may eventually like kind of start pushing out gas and they might evolve into a large scale one. And as I said, not all of them might evolve to a large scale one. They might in some galaxies, you might have like dense gas clouds kind of pressing the jet. And then those remain those small scale ones. And that's why you see much more small scale kind, kind of, you always see more compact sources than those extended FR1, FR2 sources. Every, like we know that FR1, FR2 sources are not that many. Those are much like less in number. 
And one of the theories that we have is that maybe some of those gas, dense gas clouds, they do not let the jet go beyond the certain scale. So these are called frustrated jets because they cannot move beyond the certain scale. But yeah, our hypothesis is that, you know, they some of them might become this large scale things that we're seeing. It, got, it also would be the other way down, but like at least from the observations we have. Okay. Yes, So my question is uh, like I have also like I think I'll start with one. So you you are saying that out of like two thousand there were only around uh, one to two. Yeah. So uh so, but initially we started with that why we are detecting uh, like star formations because there could be uh, feedback effects. So, uh -huh. so, but we are so uh, we are getting only one fifty red vibrations. What could be the other possible scenarios yeah. for not getting that in the control? Yeah, that's yeah, that's huh? They are really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's actually a great question. So, I feel like so one of the theories, so one of the things that we actually tested is what's the duty cycle of these galaxies and how often they can go in and out and how often they can turn on and off. So if you, so you cannot watch a galaxy evolve, right? You have to just take snapshots of different galaxy and just piece together a puzzle. So when you are looking at a certain time, let's say t time equal to t, you would catch a galaxy at a certain, like as a certain, you know, phase of that global evolutionary picture. We think that these red geysers, they actually turn on off and off. And if you look at the same red geyser after a certain million years, you would not be able to see these geyser signatures because that is related to the amount of gas you have and you can be able to trickle, like, trickle that gas to the black hole and the black hole would be able to turn on that, that, those kind of winds. And we calculated what's the duty cycle and we found that to be like 0.1 per giga year or things like that. So it's kind of same as a minor merger rate. So our hypothesis is that, okay, maybe there is a merger coming in or a minor merger, but there is some accretion that is happening and there is gas coming in. And then that just turns on the AGM for a few, for a few years, for a few million years. And you see this red geyser and then it turns off and then you would not be able to differentiate them from control galaxies. Because as I said, you cannot differentiate a red geyser and a control galaxy is just based on global properties. They're they are same. So, you know, something must be happening with the accretion and, uh, you know, yeah. So yeah, it's basically in one sentence, it's it's probably a phase. Yeah. Yes, you can ask one more question. So um, can you tell us uh can you tell us uh any uh initial like this in the in the uh we also detected the full gas in the electrical galaxy. Yeah. How they 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 the cold gas? Yeah, yeah. So when I said actually cold gas, I meant cool and cold gas. Uh, but yeah, there have been detections of cold gas as well. There is a survey called Atlas 3D. So it's I think it's by Davis uh, Davis et al. So if you look at the Atlas 3D paper, so they used uh, Khalifa. So that's another uh, IFU survey, and they looked at the CO like using Alma and Apex, and they detected uh, cold gas like visible cold gas in those galaxies. Some of them showed some star formation, some of them didn't. And like, uh, and that survey was basically looking at only early type galaxies. I think they were looking at some hundred, some hundreds of galaxies. And uh, yeah, and then cool, the, the cool neutral gas that I was showing, those are not cold gas. So you, you cannot form stars from cool gas. So that's like a temperature of 100 Kelvin. To form, cold, to form stars, you need to get down to 10 Kelvin or even lower. So that's cold molecular gas. We actually don't detect any cold molecular gas in our red geysers. So we don't detect any star formation. We don't detect any cold gas. So we followed some of them with ALMA and we did, didn't detect anything. And EPICS, yeah. It's just smaller. So I'm just curious, what is the, um, the difference between the amount of cold gas in the uh, electrical and spiral? Oh yeah, that's, I think the gas to stellar, if I tell you in gas to stellar mass, it will be hard to, so the gas to stellar mass ratio is somewhere, so for spirals is like 0.2 and for uh, ellipticals is like 0.03. So how do you convert that? I have to do that. So stellar mass is like, for spirals is like 10 to the nine 
and for elliptical is like 10 to the 10. So you, yeah, you do the math. Yeah. My question was that at the beginning, we saw the picture of the regular galaxy, you can see and then we saw that there was a pocket picture interact where there was interaction between the radio rates and the port gas. So, did you have the chance to observe anything similar? Yeah, so we don't say, as I said, those are in clusters. So those are much like like much bigger, brighter signatures. We did, don't expect to see those kind of uh, like cavities, like because in elliptical galaxy, so the, the pockets that you were seeing were in hot gas. So that was detected in X-ray. So if you look at the X-ray map of an elliptical galaxy, it's really hard to detect on a single galaxy by galaxy basis. In most cases, you have to stack. We even get some signal. So in order to see those pockets and to see those jets in those small scale, it's really hard to do. So yeah, you don't see that. So that's why I said there is no direct evidence. So you have to kind of pick out from those low luminosity signatures and kinematics and jet and host galaxy together. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Two questions. Yeah. Yes, sure. What is the new spatial position for the guys? What do you mean on sky? On sky or in the cluster center? No. So, uh, yeah, so we did check uh, whether they have some environmental dependence. These are mostly isolated. Some of them do have companions. And actually, one of those uh, showed this companion, and you can see gas kind of coming in SDS. Like you can see those tails in SDSS, and then that is joined by those sodium D signatures. So we actually see those cool gas being fed by those companions. So in some of them, we see that. In some of them, they don't have any signature of any like, um, like companion or any close merger scenario. But if you look at deeper images, so these are also SDSS images. So it's really hard to see like any structures in the image, right? So we looked at, so I looked at some of the legacy, DESI legacy survey imaging. And there I actually see like some galaxies have this kind of shells and tidal tails, you know, an aftermath of like a merge, like a minor merger, or maybe a few, several years after a merger. But just looking at nearest neighbors, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't see. <laughs> no preferred position. No. And next question is, uh, so you can measure the gas dynamic. Yeah. So is there any point, uh, what is the kinetic energy, what is yeah. the radio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did that. So the kinetic energy is roughly around like I actually had the the number. So it's like ten to the thirty nine arc second arc per second to ten to the forty arc per second. So the rate the rate of kinetic the kinetic energy. And if I compare that with the radio, like the power of the radio, so the radio power is coming out to be a few times ten to the forty one arc per second. So the radio power is slightly like bigger than the wind power that we are measuring. Um, and if you look at the cooling rate of some of these gas, so that's actually like less. So the radio power is actually enough, just talking energetically. So the cooling rate is somewhere around like 10 to the 39 or 10 to the 40. So the cooling rate is actually can be offset by this jet jet mechanical energy. So I actually looked at the radio power versus mass and things like that. So there is, of course, you know, there is a known, like known correlation between the radio power and mass. So that we see, but we don't see any specific correlation with, let's say, H alpha, like, extra. yeah, we don't, like, I, I wouldn't say I spend a lot of time on it, but like, I, I didn't see any obvious signature, but also these are really hard to bring down to a number because you have all these. 3D map, like 2D maps. So how do you bring down, bring it down to one number? Like how do you average it? So that's a problem we always face. But yeah, didn't see much correlation. There might be. I just haven't really looked at it. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I ask maybe one token question? So, so we we saw your stacked radio fluxes, and we clearly saw that. They are higher. I mean, the red lasers have a lot more radio, hmm. five, six times more radio. And so, yeah, I mean, our thing, of course, seems like it's coming from a 
We are definitely coming from the, the source of the radio is an AGM. Is that somewhere being confirmed that yeah, they are AGM? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't show that. So I have like a like four by four diagnostic diagram where you can look at like you know the stellar properties d4000 huh? no. uh no the bpt is one yeah. the white color is another if you if there is a correlation between white yeah. color infrared and radio there is a correlation between like stellar like d4000 versus radio and you can see how much radio you expect to see if these are all coming from stars and then you know if there are some excess over like a few like orders then you can say these are coming from agm so we did all those checks and we were confirmed so we did that yes okay so that that yeah. confirmed that the source of the radio is definitely i mean there this is these are agm systems yeah and then we also have some jbla image which was like higher resolution and we only got like 10 galaxies that was done like a little bit was early part and then yeah, we we saw that these were coming from like these were not star formation blobs. Like we we they had the better resolution, so it helped us seeing those jet images. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 any other question? Yes. Uh, Sorry, Sorry. Uh, you look for radio. You got radio. That's all very good. But let's say if you don't get any radio, hmm. but again, I mean, let's say you are seeing outflowing hot gas and inflowing cold gas. No radio. Yeah. Would your conclusion be different? No, but like those, there are red geysers like that. Like the det detection is like, like how much? It's not a lot. We think low power, we are like 40% detection or 35% detection. So not all of them are detected. And some of them might not be visible in radio. They might have an AGM. But those are really, these would be low luminosity and I don't know how to detect them. Like they would definitely not be detected in X-ray, not in gamma rays. And if you look at optical, it's really hard to separate them in BPT because how do you separate AGN shots, liners, all lying on the same region. How do you detect that? Mm -hmm. So, okay. I'm just yeah. saying that I mean, feedback means there is some, I mean, there may not be significant radio emission, there may not be, a, you know, yeah. significant jet, but there could still be AGN feedback. Yeah, so the AGN feedback actually, okay, again, uh, historically speaking and according to literature, the AGN feedback again is kind of divided into a few different uh, modes. So one is this accretion efficient mode, or this is radiative. called the quasar mode. So this is the radiative mode. And then the other is the radio mode or the radiatively inefficient mode, and that's the maintenance mode. And people generally think that when you have an inefficient accretion, it's really hard to turn on a really bright optical AGN. So that's when the radio jet kind of trigger in. And that's where people have looked at radio AGNs and they have kind of made this calculation, uh, made this correlation. Uh, but yes, true, like you can have AGN which is not bright in radio, but still they can do feedback. Like you don't need to be detected in radio. That's why actually simulators do not like this term radio mode feedback. Like I have talked to Rachel Somerville and they're saying, okay, now like, please get rid of this radio mode. So she, she prefers jet mode or preventative mode or things like that. So it's different if you talk to different people, but generally like speaking about, if you want to think in a, you know, like collective term coming from observation and simulations, people generally relate that with radio. So that's the first thing you start with. But yeah, there are advisors which are not radio detected, right? As I said, uh, there are radio detection, not enough radio detection. No, I guess, I, I guess uh, probably physically a better thing to say is that when you talk about radiatively efficient yeah. uh, feedback mode, that's, yeah. that's essentially uh, we're talking about radiation and that radiation radiation pressure that. actually does yeah, right? radiation pressure and, and here it yeah this is the work done yeah it's, it's more like the work done it's more like a, yeah and it's more like the jet mechanical energy not, uh, not like jet. mechanical mode of so that's why radiation. you need a jet for that so that's why people generally associate it yes, with radiation that's right. so that, and that was, you cited this example they were a Suzuki and yeah. Suzuki was the first yeah, to, yeah. to use the yeah. word radio mode yeah yeah uh, so these uh, these nomenclatures are are really like yeah, but I think the bigger question is very interesting as as Peter said that and also I think Omunanda was pointing out that we see this uh, we believe that Asian feedback has a very big role to play in galaxy evolution uh, when you look at galaxy luminosity functions in particular the high end of the luminosity function and we see them very directly in cluster scales. Yeah. There are many that have been seen. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, I know, I know. So, what I told you, we had some work yeah, yeah, yeah. at radio. Yeah, uh, there was one by Grant Finlay, and then yes. there is one by there. Yeah. Yeah. And then we are thinking of going down even lower to the galaxy scale. Yeah. 
So, but then the bigger question remains is that if alien feedback has such a big role to play the evolution of galaxies, then they, they will be much more ubiquitous beyond radio and uh, in, in all um, all scales of structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you need multi wavelengths. You that's need right. to follow up with different. I actually don't know what these look like in X-ray. Like this is, I think, one wavelength that I have not looked at at I all. Is this? Yeah, I would say that we could track them in in see in whether it's have X-ray. Yeah, like I, I, I mean, I think the only thing that I can do is rosette because otherwise there is not spacious. Erosit, I have talked, but like, uh, mm -hmm. so you know, Shagli, so the paper that Shagli can we wrote, well, that was about of course we optically selected in here, but what we did, they were not selected in to X ray. So, what we did, this was using the deep service. Yeah. What we did is we stacked, I mean, we stacked what data set you used? <laughs> that's a deep data set, <laughs> deep two server. So, that's pretty like red, roughly redshift one. So, what, uh, so these are uh, the point sources that are detected, but then we got rid of the ones which had X-ray counterparts because if we have so much X-ray emission, so what our goal was to actually look at the diffuse X-ray emission in mm -hmm. these the certain galaxies, and that's why we had to exclude the X-ray bright mm -hmm. area because that yes, it was so mm -hmm. uh, so big and so spread out. So, but yes, I think one good thing as Sarah suggested is we. Probably to follow up these systems in X-ray then have to see uh, the, the X-ray. Yeah. Even though less, we do see X-rays in some way in the future. Yeah. So that's something that I have not. I do, I talked to like Andrea Marloni from the Erosita survey. Okay. And he's yeah. like, okay, yeah, I, we are still doing the path one, path two, like co Like the, the galaxy is a yeah. paradigm is yeah. so that you know, things are falling in the dark. Yeah, and I, I also so wanted to like look at the diffuse hot the gas in the elliptical because that has been a question for a long time. Yes. And if you can, I don't know, rotate and do things, mm -hmm. select them in a certain way, you can probably do that. Yes. But like, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't looked at X-ray. And these are the typical sizes of the images, right? So the typical size in kiloparsecs. 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, so these are like 10 to 15 kiloparsecs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? If not, let's thank Norman Yeah, yeah, for sure. 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 Yeah, for